Hi, uh, you can see we're in a new chapter. There's a nice comic. And uh, so now uh, we talked in the previous chapter about uh, random variables and we did, uh, you were building mass functions for discrete random variables. And chapter five just looks at some of the special cases of the discrete random variables. Um, I think of them like a like a story. Every random variable tells a story. In fact, I'm going to have to post for you. I have a nice uh, sheet that summarizes the really the most important discrete and continuous distribution. So I'll have to send myself a note to remember to do that. Um, that's a very helpful sheet. And um, anyway, uh, let, let me go on from there. Um, we're going to just start with I think maybe one of the most useful random variables uh, that are discrete, that's discrete, um, the Bernoulli and the binomial. Um, well, like I said, it has a story, so I can tell you the stories of these different kinds of random variables. Um, probably the most basic random variable is called the, the Bernoulli random variable. Um, it was invented by one of the Bernoullis, a very famous family of mathematicians, and um, this random variable just takes on two values, either one or zero. It could actually it could be any two values, but it's either usually it uh, it's an experiment where you do something and you you either have a success or a failure, and we're going to say p is the probability of success. So um, you can label however you want, but most of the time we say x equals one is a success and x equals zero is a, is a failure. And then the probability mass function is always just given by um, the probability x equals 1 is p, and the probability x equals 0 is 1 minus p, and that's a valid probability mass function. If you add up p and 1 minus p, it adds up to 1, and, uh, and p is just the parameter of uh, the probability of success, and we call this x a Bernoulli distribution. So it's a Bernoulli. A Bernoulli is you do something, and you either have a success or a failure, and there's probability associated with each, and they add to one. So um, this is very popular. And anything where you on pass, fail, yes, no, make, miss, defect, non-defective. So probably the here's the most basic Bernoulli: flip a coin, flip a fair coin. We'll let x equal one be a head, and we'll let x equal zero be a tail. And so the x can only take on two values, one and zero, and probability is half and half. Um, the mean of this random variable would be 1 times a half, 0 times a half, so it's a half, which makes sense. On the long run, you should expect about the same of both of them. Um, I just wanted to show you not our Bernoulli's are 50-50. Um, at Ohio State, we could take classes pass-fail, and pretty much if you showed up, um, you were going to pass a course. But the probability of passing one of these courses, I'm going to label as 80% x equal 1 is a pass, and we'll say x equals 0 is a fail. So the random variable x can either take on two values, either you pass or you fail, and 80 or 20 percent. It's a valid random variable, adds to 1. You could find the mean, the mean is 0.8. Um, from a Bernoulli we can build a binomial. So a binomial is really just n Bernoulli trials. So you do something n times, and you count how many times you were successful. And p is the probability of success. It's always a number between 0 and 1. So there's, like I said, stories with every random variable. A binomial random variable, um, x, is the story of you do something n times, and uh, out of those n times, you count how many times you were successful. There's only two choices. Either you're successful or you're not successful. P is the probability of being successful on each trial. It's constant, so that's not going to change. And the trials need to be independent. One outcome, one success shouldn't affect the next being a success, etc. So binomial is a story that um, I like to think of it as basketball for me, um, uh, free throws. Um, a typical binomial, you go down to the gym, you have 10 free throws, your probability of success is 60%. You shoot 10, how many you make out of 10? And so you can make 0, 1, 2, 3, up to 10, and there's probability associated with each of those. So um, here's a binomial. X is, um, you buy circuit boards, uh, the probability of defect is 5%, non-defect 95%. 
Um, this might sound weird to you, but I'm going to let X be the number of defective boards in the sample of three. So um, you can label a success anything you want. Here I'm making a success of defective board. Trials are independent. Every board you pick should be independent of the others. Um, it's either defective or not defective. A success is actually um, having a defective board, so that's going to be 5%. And uh, do we want to know how many are defectives out of the group we choose? So I'm counting how many successes out of three. And there, um, it's kind of nice in class we built it by hand, but here is the binomial. Um, for example, um, the probability x equals zero defective boards means that zero of them, that's too bad, zero of them were defective, or sorry, yeah, zero of them were defective, and all of them were good, right? So notice up here, um, you have a difference. It'll be p to the x, 1 minus p to the 3 minus x. Either you're defective or not defective. If you put in zero, that means there were zero defective and three non-defective. And I think most people get this part right here, the p to the x, one minus p to the three minus x. This, this though, we have to account for the number of ways that could happen. I mean, you're choosing three boards. You could have a good board, and then a bad board, and a good board, or you could have a bad board, right, and two goods, or you could have um, a good and a good, and a bad. So there's like three ways you could choose one of them to be bad. So I have to, this accounts for the number of ways we could rearrange and get uh, three or one defective out of three or two defectives out of three or that's why I need that binomial coefficient. So every binomial has this as their probability mass function. You're, it, it's always going to take on this form. So that's what I'm showing you on the next page. Um, this is the form of a binomial. It's always going to be probability of success to the x because I want x successes. 1 minus p to the n minus x because all the other ones have to be failures. Um, I'm independent so I can multiply these. And then out front I have to see how many ways can I choose x, x successes out of n trials. The support always goes from 0 to n, always, 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 because you could have no successes all the way up to n successes. Again, think of basketball. You shoot 10, you could have make none, 1, 2, all the way up to 10. And I'm just showing you the cumulative function. Um, it's really just this mass function summed up to the value x. Um, a lot of times I use this little symbol. x has the shape of or the form of a binomial. n is number of trials. p is probability of success. So um, we build a few in class. Um, 20% of uh, textbooks fail a binding test. X is the number of four that fail the test. So X here um, failing is a success. And I want the mass function. So probability of um, here failing the um, binding test is a success. So 0.2 to the X, um, 0.8 to the four minus X. I could have all of them fail none of them fail anywhere in between and I need that binomial coefficient out there to count the number of ways um, I can verify for you this I mean P of X is always positive there's nothing in here that would make it negative and with a little trick from theorem 2.5 um, in the counting chapters uh, this sum right here I'm going to use the binomial expansion is equal to this by the theorem you see below, which is 1. What am I trying to show you? I'm trying to show no matter what you put in for n, as long as n is an integer positive and p between 0 and 1, this guy is always going to sum to 1, so we know he's always a valid probability mass function. So 5, I build another one. You can plug and chug once you get your p of x. You know, what's the probability? There's 2. Of whatever just stick in two I so probably there's more than one just stick in more than one so once you get your function you just evaluate it at whatever values you're interested in um, this is very nice I mean we know the definition for the mean of a random variable we already did that in chapter four but now let's sub in um, right here I'm just subbing in what p of x is for a binomial 
And then I'm going to do some fancy stuff here. So a lot of this is just trickery to make it look nicer. Um, I listed reasons over here. Here's all the reasons why I'm doing what I'm doing. But I'm just playing around to make this look a little bit nicer. You do enough proofs and you kind of know what you have to do. But the nice part of it is um, if I sum this guy all up and I'm just showing the mechanics of it, it's always going to sum to n times p. You don't believe me, put it in maple. I'm not saying that's a great way to prove, but if you want to believe, that thing will always sum to n times p, and the variance will always be n times p1 minus p. So the expected value of a binomial is always n times p, which kind of makes sense. I mean, if you shoot a basket uh, 10 times, you go down and shoot 10 free throws, and you're a 60% free throw shooter, um, I expect you to make six shots. That's the expected value. Um, and so from now on, if, I, if you know you have a binomial and I ask you the mean, you know there's a nice formula for it, and there's also a nice formula for the variance here. So down here, I just showed you a few. Here's a couple binomials, and if I ask you for mean and variance, you don't. You can always use, I mean, there's no reason you can't use, go back to the formula uh, P of X. You know, I mean, that's the definition of expected value. You can always plug in your mass function times x and sum it over your x's, but it will always come out to be n times p for a binomial and n times p1 minus p for variance. Um, there was just another example. Graphs, it's uh, for different n's and p's. Um, you can see what a binomial looks like. It's, again, not surprising like here. You do something 100 times, your probability of success is a half. Your mean should be sitting at 50. Um, 50 trials, probability of success a half. Your mean should be sitting at 25. So um, I think it's interesting to note, and we'll bring this up later, that a binomial, as long as n times p is fairly big, where big is around 10 or so, you will start seeing this to look very normal curve-like, which um, that's nice. We can estimate a binomial with a normal under certain conditions. If you took statistics, you might remember this or you might have seen it. I love that. Yeah, things come out to be bell curves. I mean, you, you can see, I think I have one that isn't, and uh, this isn't quite, and you can kind of see why. I mean, you only had six trials, probability of success a third, so notice your bell curve doesn't get to go all the way down because it can't, you know, you can't take on a negative number of successes. So if you're not pushed far enough away from the x-axis, you're not going to get a nice normal curve. So the, if, you, if you multiply n times p, you get something like 2, you're not spread out far enough from the um, 0 to get a nice bell curve, but um, we'll bring that up later. And uh, that's it for tonight.